fascinating chapter. Uh, it deals with this whole topic of God's will and God's guidance and his direction for our life. Um, I, and I know that in one message you can't cover that entire, those, those, those ideas exhaustively. But we're in Acts chapter 21 this morning. And uh, hopefully as we go through it, um, there, there's just ideas that can speak to us uh, on those topics. You know, all the way through the book of Acts, Paul went out of his way to minister to his own people, the Jewish people. And a lot of times it got him in trouble, like we're going to see at the end of this chapter. It got him in a whole bunch of trouble. Uh, he was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter was called to be the apostle to the Jewish people. Now, obviously, there's going to be some crossover, some overlap, and, and we saw that, we've seen that in the book of Acts. But for the most part, that was Peter's assigned calling, and that was Paul's assigned calling. That was God's for each of them. And it, it's interesting to see how God guided them in regards to his... Interestingly, um, God gives us, I believe, a lot of... That every little detail is preordained and destined, you know, you stub your toe or something like that, that everything is, you know, preordered by God. I, I don't see it that way. Uh, when I look at uh, my own life, when I look at what I see in Scripture, it's interesting. Paul, uh, Peter was called to be the apostle to the Jews, but who was the first Gentile that came to the Lord, and who did the Lord use for that? It was Cornelius, wasn't it? And the Lord used Peter, the apostle to the Jews, to, to bring him into the church. And, of course, Paul, being the apostle to the Gentiles, you know, he's always reaching out to the Jewish people. So this morning, uh, just to float some ideas past you, just to throw it out there, I think that within God's will is what you might call the permissible will of God. Need to do, and then there's other things where the Lord sort of leaves it up to us. Kind of reminds me of the guy who... Woke up one morning, he looked in his sock drawer, and he asked God, he said, Okay, Lord, what color should I wear? Black, white, blue, or I swear what's clean? All right? Because God doesn't really care what color of socks you wear, whether they're black or white. He doesn't care what color of underwear you, you wear, you know? And, and, you know, there's a lot of things where God just sort of leaves it up to you to make a decision. The text this morning, and uh, what a beautiful chapter this, what a great story this is. Uh, chop ourselves away from them. We put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. Sea and seashore back in chapter uh, 20. All right, so here they're just lead to Patera. You notice we see the word we here. We. And so Luke is included in here. Verse 2. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia. Went on both of it. We sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre. Where our is. Here we are. We're reading about Paul, and, uh, you know, when we read other earlier chapters, uh, there's time verses. Paul, from the seashore of Ephesus, and, and it's just a nice little travel log of his trip. And an example of the Christian life, smooth sailing. Do you know that if you will, they'll tell you certain things, but if you really ask questions, a lot of times it comes down to this. I know I'm in the center of God's will, and when I have no problems, and everything is smooth sailing. Or as I like to talk about it, or call it, I call it peaches and cream theology. Do you know what I'm talking about? Everything is peaches and cream. When everything is peaches and cream, the Apostle Paul, what we've seen so far in the first 20 chapters of this book, no. If anything, Paul had smooth sailing literally on his way to Jerusalem, um, but little did anyone know, and at least, at least Paul, for sure here, Roman soldiers to stop him during a riot because they wanted to tear him apart. Anyways, let's continue on with the chapter. Quite interesting. Verse 4. With them seven days, through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to... Interesting phrase here in verse 4. It says, through the Spirit, they urged him not to go to Jerusalem. What basically... The Lord was kind of warning Paul about what was going to happen to him. So verses 5 and 6, verse 5 says this, But when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and children accompanied us out of the city, and they, and they returned 
home. Um, to go to Jerusalem, but still they supported him. Paul says, I want to go to Jerusalem. They're saying, no, don't go to Jerusalem because, you know, look what we, we, we have. This. But at the end of it, what do they do? They get together with Paul and they kneel and they pray. It's a good word for all of us here in this church and in any church. Isn't it great? In a sense, a spirit of agreement with them. In a sense, a, a spirit of blessing with them. What do we do? We dig our heels in. We dig our heels, you and the other person. But here these guys disagreed with Paul, but at the end of it, we need to see more of that going on within our churches and within our relationships. Continuing on, verse 7, it says, We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Tomas, where we greeted at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. The power of the gospel to change people's lives been the first time that Paul and Philip met each other. We don't know. But when Philip was back in Acts chapter 6 and 7, he was one of the originals when the Grecian uh, uh, Jewish widows were neglected. And so they picked seven guys to serve those Jewish widows. And uh, Philip was one of them. Another one that was picked was a guy named Stephen who became who? The first Christian martyr. All right? And uh, back Paul who was then at that time called Saul. But there was a persecution of the church in Jerusalem, and Paul was a part of that persecution, Caesarea, where he settled down for about the next 20 years. And here is Paul in verses 6 and uh, 7. Uh, for the first time, they're meeting each other, right, to have been there, all right? Because here is Paul meeting Philip between them. And it's, uh, you know, if you want proof of the power of the God, 7 and 8. The power to change people's lives. Saul of Tarsus is now past. And here, here's the takeaway from these couple verses. If you want, you have to, in order to go forward, you have to stop looking back. You have to forgive what's happened in the back, what's in the past, and move forward. It's kind of like the guy, and he said this to his friend. He says, I hate getting into an argument with my wife every time. Be oracle. And, and, and the friend looks at him and says, you mean she gets hysterical. Drags up everything in the past that I ever did that was wrong against me. She gets hysterical. have to deal with that, you know, hysterical and historical. Forgiveness, okay, forgiveness, forgetting all those things that we like to put in our filing cabinets and keep them as delayed bombshells. For marriage, you know, it's like uh, every, you, you're, you're living on love, you're living on, you know, it's all, it, you, you start living on what they call money. All right, the bills, right? And, then, and all of a sudden, you've done, and then you know what happens is you start going to the filing cabinet and you pull something that had happened a month ago. A delayed bombshell is something that goes off way after than when it landed. And we have to be careful about that because especially in marriage or with your kids or your grandkids or anything, it, it, digging up the past all the time because it never seems to bring healing to it. You know the calculators that you have on your phone? All right. Or the electronic calculators. There's that. It stands for clear. M stands for memory. If you hit the M, it goes into the memory. And you keep hitting the M, and it keeps bringing up. Clear button takes all the information, and it's eliminated from the calculator. If you made a wrong calculation, there's no record of the mistake. It's lost forever. Because that's what the C button stands for, for us, spiritually, right? So every time you see the cross, we want God to treat us like that. God, and that's what it means to pick up your cross daily, die to self, and follow him. Well, verse 9 goes on, the uh, original seven deacons. It says in verse 9, it says he had four unmarried daughters, Philip. And it seems like he is a very mature man, a very mature believer in the Lord, the gift to lead people to Christ. But what's remarkable is that four kids? He had four daughters, and uh, it seems um, the Lord. And so these four kids, you know, they're, you know, here's something I want to point throw out to you this morning. As we have gone through this book, is the value of waiting on the Lord and God use you. And I think we need a whole lot more of that. I don't think letting God speak to you and let God use you has to be strange or weird or awkward like some people make it. 
I think that when it comes to God guiding us or warning us, I think God works like that today. I've seen him do it in my life, and it's a good thing. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Um, in the very next verse comes this. Uh, it says, after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named, we saw Agabus earlier in Acts chapter 11, where he predicted the famine that was going to come to the city of Jerusalem. Now get a hold of what he does next here in these next couple of verses. Get a fly on the wall and see this happen. Uh, here comes Agabus, and in verse 11, coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem belt and will hand them over to the Gentiles. Can you imagine being there when Agabus took Paul's belt, bound his own hands, and said, this is what's going to happen to the owner of this belt, Paul. I mean, wow. That, that, talk about drama, I guess. You know, God was warning Paul. And so God warns us not to proceed, to change our course. Sometimes God, which was it here? Well, what's interesting is that everybody that's there, and Paul interprets it in an entirely different way. All right, so follow me. Let's, let's look at this verse, because this is what happens to us. We misinterpret what God is telling us a lot of times. Look at verse 12. When we heard this, we to Jerusalem. Verse 13. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 14. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. The Lord's will be done. You know, bottom line is that should be really something we should be saying on a regular basis and meeting it. The Lord's will be done. The Lord's will be done. The Apostle James uh, in his letter said, you know, we make these plans all the time saying, I'm going to go to this city. I'm going to make this much money. I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And guys, there's nothing wrong with having plans and goals and all that sort of thing. But ultimately, we need to submit to the Lord and say, well, the Lord's will, the Lord's will, the Lord's will. And let the Lord be in control because I can't tell you how many times I've set plans and goals without even praying about it, and then it doesn't turn out, and then I end up saying, Lord, so many times this happens, and there just comes a point where you need to surrender to the Lord. Now, um, the word we, here is Luke and Agabus and the whole the prophet gave. And the key thing to note here is this interesting spirit said here, all right? They, 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 were, they, they responded two different ways. Don't go, you're, you're headed into danger. You're headed into rough water. I know that I want to go forward because I've been warned by the Lord that my ministry was going to be full of persecution and suffering. Jesus told me that what, the day I got saved on the road to Damascus. I, sometimes we re hear information from the Lord, and it's the right information. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's so important to get this. That's why we need to be a farmer who wanted to be an evangelist. All right, I love these stories that I come up with, all right? Sitting under a tree during his lunch break. And while he was uh, sitting there under the tree, he looked up into the pea and see. And he jumped up from the ground. He, he sold his farm, and he went into the ministry because he figured those letters meant preach Christ. P, hearing his preaching, and he was a horrible preacher. He was a terrible preacher. And I'm sure God wasn't telling you just to plant corn, all right? Because the mistake of how things are interpreted because we're so dogged the guys all right so um versus after this incredible development with agabus sorry right? after this we got ready and brought us to the home of manathan where we were to stay he was Muslim. the brothers received us warmly all right had collected money from the gentile churches and he was bringing the gift to the Jerusalem church because it had, and so they received him warmly, which is interesting, <clears throat> all right? And it was still struggling with its Jewish traditions. Here's the problem with religion. Here's the problem with ritual and ceremony. And we get our eyes off of the really important things. And the Jew race 
and the law, and they couldn't quite totally take at least a number of them pack your baggage, especially if you come out of another faith belief system. That's the problems that they were having in the Jerusalem church for quite a number of years. So verse 18, James and all the elders were present. James was the leader of the Jerusalem church. Verse 9, ministry. When they heard this, they praised God, and they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many they have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from shall we do. They will certainly hear that you have come. And guys, Paul, flexible, something that religious people aren't. Religion, and I'm talking about all religion, it makes you inflexible. You start to become actually unteachable open to what the Lord wants to do in your life in a new way. Well, Paul was, and that was part of his mission when he went to Jerusalem to share the gospel of grace. Well, let's pick it up in verse 20. It says, so do what we tell you. There were four, so let's just stop there. Verse 23 basically tells us there, there were four men, verse chapter 6. What's the Nazarite vow? Well, Basically, you, from the 60s, well, they had their New Testament hippies called the Nazarite vow. They drank no wine in a period of time. It was basically all about, you know, ritual ceremonial cleansing, being uh, ritually pure. Anyways, seven days altogether. Okay, so let's pick it up in verse 24. That's what's going on here. All right? Purification rites and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. There is no truth in these reports about you but that you yourselves are... There's all these rumors floating around about Paul saying he had absolutely no regard for, instance, for these four men who had taken the Nazarite vow. And that would show to all of Jerusalem wasn't against the Old Testament as we see it nowadays. And he said, they, they basically said, if you pay their expenses, you're basically being a believers. We have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food to serve the Lord. They knew that. But they were still stuck that's what Paul meant by that. He, was, he had a certain flexibility. He wasn't compromising. He's just careful of the people that you're around. You know, last night we went to the uh, Rib Fest. Do you know what I'm talking about? The, the London Rib Fest? For a couple of ribs. Anyway, so we go in there. <clears throat> and they have all these vendors. But before you try to wash it off, I'm going, everybody in church is going to think, not only do I have a tattoo, but in the places where the people are, you blend in. And, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to do everything that the people are doing around, right? But, you know, you're with the people, and that's what Paul was trying to do. He was trying to blend in, promote unity, make it work, that flexible spirit. That's what Paul would think, or their baggage. And so, you know, what if a guy has long hair? Church a few months ago, I, and I said, no, I didn't really kick Jesus out of the church. I kicked your religion out of the church, all right? They have absolutely no answer to. Anyways, this was a good thing that Paul was doing here. A certain flexibility in his heart offering would be made for each of them. Now, guys, I know we read this in the book of Acts, purification rites. All right? He had been made clean by the power of the gospel. But this is talking about ceremonial, ritualistic purification. All right? Seven. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province Greeks into the temple area and defiled this holy place. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were sh Talk about a riot. So in the temple, there were engraved signs. It, you know, it's on your own head if you enter this. Can you it was pretty nasty and pretty threatening. Anyways... This is what's going on. They shut the gates, all right? And this was the, not Roman guards, but the temple guards. So the last thing you wanted, if you were the ruler of the city or uh, the Roman soldiers, was to have this kind of a riot going on. Verse 32. He had once took some officers in the temple, actually, the Temple Mount area. So they were right beside it. Verse 32. Uh, taken to, into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps... The violence of the man, Paul up the steps, they must have hauled Paul up on their shoulders or something like that. It was quite the sight. Verse the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000? He spoke to the guard. He was speaking in Greek, which showed that he was, you know, who this guy Paul was. So, you know, he jumped to conclusions. He thought Paul must have been one of those terrorists you know, back in, I think it was around 54 A.D., there was an Egyptian who, and uh, a number of those 
people got killed, but this, the leader escaped, all right? And so the soldier thought Paul was this Egyptian terrorist leader, if you will, until Paul spoke Greek, which, you know, helped this lead. I want to finish off the chapter here. Paul answered, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. So here was Paul. The city was in a riot. There's 200 soldiers that are going to be an escort for him pretty soon. He's got a whole bunch of people surrounding him right now. They're hauling him up on the steps. And Paul says, hey, can, we, can you stop for a second? Let me have a few words. And then verse 40, having received the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd when they were all silent. silent. He said to them in Aramaic, and then we stop right there because that's next week's sermon. All right? But here's the kicker, all right? I, I love this chapter. It's really amazing. The whole city's there, it seems. The guards were there. And Paul's standing on the steps, and he uses it as a pulpit to preach to the people. And the people have to listen to him because he's got an armed guard standing there. All right? So now, you know, we look at this chapter, and I kind of entitled it, um, oh, I did entitle it, Smooth Sailing and the Will of God. There is this idea that in order to be right in the very center of God's will, that everything is got to work out just right, that everything's got to be peaches and cream, smooth sailing, that everything's just got to work out like this, like this, and like this. And we have this prosperity theology that has crept into the church subconsciously. We have this health and wealth gospel where there's no suffering, there's no difficulties, it's a North American theology where we just get, keep getting richer and richer and richer and skinnier and better looking and younger. You, you hear what I'm saying? It's permeated the Christian church. And this idea of suffering or challenge or things not working out the way you planned because you planned it, because all the success gurus say if you plan this, this, and this, you will reach your goals because you have the will, the self-will to make it happen. And then when the plans don't work out, we kind of shake our fist at God. Guys, listen to me. There are times in the Christian life that, when, that being at the center of God's will includes rough waters. Amen? That's the way it is. That's my story. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be challenge. There's going to be rejection, which we're going to see next week with Paul in the next chapter. And so let me throw it out to you like this. Um, I often tell people there's four C's to understanding God's will, God's guidance in your life. And if you want to jot them down, they all start with the word C. First of all, there's the counsel of God, which is the word of God. What does the counsel of God tell you to do? It's very black and white. In Paul's case, it was the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And it was the words of Jesus on the Damascus Road where he said, you're going to be my witness but you're going to have suffering and persecution and rejection. And so what does the counsel of God say? What does God's word clearly say? And then when it comes to seeking God's will and God's direction for your life, number two, counsel of godly people. And I listen, if you come to church, you just go anywhere, actually. Everybody will give you their opinion about what you think you should do. In fact, people will give you two or three opinions of what, what you should do, all right? The Bible says very clearly Listen to the counsel of godly people who are mature, who are in the word of God, who have a prayer life. So the counsel of God, and then number two, the counsel of God, uh, godly people. But then the next one is conscience, your own conscience. Pray about it. And if God gives you peace about it, then that's usually a, another green light. And I don't talk about the peace that comes from the comfort zone peace. Look at Paul. He had persecution and suffering. It wasn't the, circu you know, the things around him that were peaceful, it was a peace that he had before the Lord when he went before the Lord in prayer. Because it, it just sat right as he was in the presence of the Lord. But then number four, circumstances. What are the circumstances? Are there open doors that are really open, or are you trying to kick the doors open? <laughs> Paul tried to kick the doors open, so you can debate about what God's will looks like in this chapter. But then there's a fifth C, and I, I, I threw it in here, calling. And in this case, Paul was called to something very clearly. 
He had, a, he had a call of God to go to Jerusalem and then to Rome. And we need to look at ourselves and, and figure out what is God calling us to. F.B. Meyer, a uh, great preacher in years past, was one time on a ship and he came into port at nighttime and he was standing beside the captain. And the, he, he couldn't believe that the captain was able to steer the ship in, in pitch absolute darkness. And so he asked the captain, how are you able to guide this ship into safe port at nighttime when there's, I can't see anything on the shore? And the captain said, you see those three lights in the distance? And he says, yes. He says, when I get all three of those li lights to line up exactly into one light, that's the green light to go through. And you know, the Christian life is like that. We've got conscience, we've got circumstance, we've got the counsel of scripture. And when those lights line up before the Lord, then you move forward. Amen? And that's how you move forward. It's very simple. Now, I can't possibly cover the entire topic of God direction and God's will for your life in one little simple message, but this is one more little piece as we go through the story here, as we go through the narrative of the book of Acts. Because these are real people in real times with real difficulties, with real challenges, just like every single one of you have this week. So let's bow before the Lord, and let's ask the Lord to apply this to our lives. Father, we come to you right now, and we thank you for your word. We bless you. We praise you. And Lord, we've looked at the Apostle Paul and how he, in his walk with you, was really always working through the will of God, the guidance of God, the direction of God. And we see where things go well for him. We see where things go very difficult for him. And I pray for us this morning, Lord, if there's one takeaway that we have, it's this, not to buy in to the smooth sailing, peaches and cream theology that permeates our culture and permeates the Christian church. In fact, Lord Jesus, you said clearly, no one can be my disciple unless you deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow you. And I pray, Lord, that um, you would help us just to chip away that, at that false theology, that false philosophy of life. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to um, come to a biblical mindset, a biblical worldview, to see the world through Scripture, through your eyes. Apply these things to our hearts and minds. May we have your value system and not the value system of the world. We praise you, Lord. We bless you. We pray your Holy Spirit would take these words and seal them to our hearts. And now as we go our separate ways, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen.